Yeah, like to me, one of the things that stood out is this uh, notion of patience, I guess. Like that's the best way I I would put it. And I think it also maybe comes with, you know, time in the industry as well. Because I feel like I've also started to lean more that way in my career. But like um, at Ford, uh, like I was very young in my career and I kind of wanted everything to go quickly. And like some of the advice or, uh, you know, other employees that have been there longer is it's like, you know, like, don't sweat it. It'll like take a little bit of time and it'll get done eventually. And at least as someone very um, early in their career, I'm like, why, why wait? Let's just like go, 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 go. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krause. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Uh, if you like what you see today, please subscribe for more of these. Um, our guest today is Ken Yesh. Ken is a product manager with Root, a uh, pretty cool insurance company. Before that, he was with Uber Advanced Technology Group doing the self-driving cars, also Ford. Uh, Ken, welcome to the pod. Hey, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Great to see you. Good to see you, too. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. How's, uh, how's Pittsburgh treating you? It's treating me well. Um, just, you know, enjoying the uh, the end of the Rona. Uh, looks like business has been ramping up quite a bit. Uh, and I recently started dating again, which is awesome. So, yeah. Uh, Very good. All in makes, all... It makes it a lot easier when you don't need to stay six feet apart. Yeah, exactly. You know, the face shield was really getting in the way. <laughs> how, how's your, uh, how you been? Oh, good, good. Uh, actually, uh a little bit of a, a rough weekend getting ready for uh, my wedding coming up. Congratulations, uh, but, by sir, the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I don't know. You can uh, only imagine, like, I don't know, having, you know, four things go wrong in one weekend is a. Uh, I've heard a wedding top. planning is brutal in general. Uh, what happened with you? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it was a number of things. Like, my we had really bad raining here in uh, southeast Michigan. So my dad's basement flooded, helped him. Oh, Jesus. I'm sorry, um, man. <laughs> Yeah, and then on top of that, uh, you know how how many ways can you print an address wrong in an envelope? Was like <laughs> the game we were playing. Uh, we found out uh, that I guess inkjet doesn't stick to the envelopes we had, so we had a bunch of envelopes uh, get smudged. And then we went and bought uh, labels. We brought laser labels instead of inkjet <laughs> labels, so they got smudged again. Um, you know, third time's a charm. This morning I went and grabbed some uh, inkjet labels and uh, problems problems resolved now. But that was, uh, especially since I'm not like a professional label printer, like every time to like set up a print for these things, like takes me a couple of hours. I I'm mean, like, I don't know. How do I do this in Word? We have a client right now um, who I'm pretty good friends with who is, is also coordinating a wedding. And some of the stories he've told me is it's just highway robbery, the way they treat you when you're doing one. I don't blame you for doing it yourself, like one iota. I mean, what is it, like 30 grand you're supposed to spend on a wedding, which is just oh, so, absurd. Okay, that, uh, that's, so I actually wrote an article about that, which is is nuts. So I love- What's I, your what's your blog, by the way? I wanna, can, so, can we plug so that? I, yeah, so my blog is product for evil. And so I, try, <laughs> I, like that. I try to identify when companies are using their data and knowledge against uh, the consumer. Is Google and in there? Because you... they, they do say they're not evil, but I think they're evil. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm a little behind the ball on getting these articles out. I've only written like two, but uh, uh, you, you know, gotta start I'm getting so, I did, I did four are... practice podcasts before I released one. <laughs> So yeah, there's so, unaired ones that are terrible, like even worse than our first episode. <laughs> yeah, so you got to go back and reinvite those people on now that you're a pro. I sort of purposely picked kind of lower stakes people, and I told them it was a prank. It was it was just my friends kind of helping me out, and so you know, it's, yeah. it's one of these things like well, let me buy you a beer and we'll we'll do this. And, so yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I lit I wrote a blog post because I was just blown away. Like you said, I think like 20, 30 grand is like the the quoted average wedding cost. Wait, and that's so, the average? I thought it was like some peer pressure number they use just to, to get you. Well, and and in this case, open it, your wallet, it is, and your butt cheeks. It is because like I went and it's like that just sounded too ludicrous to me, right? So I went and like did some research, and I thought it was nuts. And you can like check out my article for more detail, but like. 
Yeah, that uh, if you uh, send me a if, link and we can post it on the thing. Yeah, we'll do. Um, that if you go and look up like average cost of a wedding and like the first seven to 10 Google results all source the exact same company. They, like, they, like, articles reposting what one company posted and that company Jesus. is in the wedding industry and wants you to spend more on weddings. And if you grab like independent research um, that I found that's like more designed for vendors and you then look at what the median cost of a wedding is instead of the average cost. Oh, you get drastically different numbers. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so that's the yeah. mean. Yeah, because I've been yeah. to weddings that easily cost like a million dollars. Correct, right? And so there's like this huge that's, long tail. Yeah, right? exactly. So if you average it in. All of a sudden, it seems like everyone's spending a fortune on weddings, where like more than half of people don't actually spend that much. Yeah. But because they average it, I you know, with the mean, right? They're like, oh, you, it's okay to spend more. Don't worry. Like, you're still beating the average, right? You're doing better than most. Don't don't feel too sad that your wedding budget blew up. No, no, no. Don't worry. It's way cheaper than Mark Zuckerberg's wedding. <laughs> like, you're totally good. <laughs> so, no, Bill Gates spent way more than you did. Don't worry about it, guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, I think, uh, yeah, so I'll definitely send that to you and you can link it in. But yeah, no, that's, cool. yeah, I I do feel Boy, like it's, it's kind of ridiculous how much they charge and how much, I don't know, they're just like ramping up the costs like every year. It's like, oh, well, now the average is higher, so you can spend more. <laughs> um, I'm guessing, but, uh, uh, th- what is it like? So 2030K is what you said, but like, has it gone up past that this year or is it? So COVID was like super weird dynamics wise. And I can give you like a little input from just like seeing the wedding industries because of COVID. So many weddings got shut down and like me and my fiance ran. Don't worry. The average is zero. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, no, surprisingly, it wasn't. It was still, you know, like 15 to 20,000 somehow. Jesus. Um, (laughs) But, uh, and so like you had a bunch of weddings canceled and like because you had to have a cap on the number of people with the COVID restrictions, like the, the cost went down in 2020, right? Now that 2021 is Were they trying around, to pitch that as like a great time to have a wedding because you can save money? <laughs> no. <laughs> <You> just see. <laughs> <laughs> there's never been a better time to get married the market is low right now you can only you can get in for under 20k <laughs> but what's not so is because so many weddings got canceled is that you saw a lot of, like a lot of these small businesses weren't capable of weathering the storm so like now in 2021 if you're looking for vendors <laughs> a bunch of people are out of business and then the people who are in business you have twice as much value because you have all the 2020 weddings and all the 2021 weddings fighting for the same set oh, of vendors. So you can pretty much name your price, which you could do already, it sounds like. So Yeah, but now, so I'll, I'll be interested robbery. to see the, the wedding reports for 2021. <laughs> How much, by the way, when I'm guessing you got a quote on what it would cost to have those invites printed before you did it yourself. Like, what did they want for that? Oh, so, so we had, we, they, we had nice invites made. But what I did is this was literally just printing our name on yeah. like our like the sendy address, the person we're sending it to on the envelope. They want to charge us like a dollar a person. I'm just like, what? We're already spending you this ungodly sum of money for <laughs> making this thing, which I didn't realize we also needed to assemble. That's why I, I, we're at the end of this. And then the person we were talking to was like, and then you just need to assemble that. And I was like, assemble you mean we just put cards in an envelope what do you mean assemble and it's like no you have to glue them together wait what so (laughs) yeah so you're just paying them to print the fucking shit and hire a graphics designer pretty much pretty much i mean and you get like nice gold foil and they print it all nice but it's like yeah i mean they essentially they just i I don't know the process but like how hard how much does a gold foil machine cost i know one engineer that i bet you i bet you I don't know. I wouldn't bet on this because I, I, it's like a 50-50 shot. But him and his wife bought a bunch of it. Like, they're always buying gear to do it themselves. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they have, like, a gold leaf machine somewhere in their basement. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's very clearly, like, the overhead design cost because, like, the incremental cost to, like, print more is almost nothing. It's like, you want 20, you want 200. It's still the same price. <laughs> It's almost like the, the variability is like was almost nothing. So it's like all their costs. So it's like, so it's like, oh, well, if we need more, 
like, can we just order more? Because I thought like design costs were already done, you get like a discount for ordering more. They're like, no, just order extra because you're gonna have to pay like essentially 80% of what you're paying now to order 20 more. And I'm like, ah, okay, then yeah, we'll just order some extra ones, I guess. Jeez, that's crazy, man. Um, but yeah, so no, nah, it's, it's <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, and uh, but I'm not having to deal with that yet. Uh, anywho. <laughs> Um, so I guess, uh, going from, you know, an advanced robotics group like Uber into insurance is like an interesting jump. Um, mm -hmm. what's that been like? Um, I guess what are some of the differences in the companies, to the extent you can talk about them, uh, if you can't, it's okay. But mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't know, I'd like to hear why you made that shift and, and how it's, how it's panned out if you want to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so uh there so, so for starters i focus in like uh automation and trying to make our claims you know more efficient and faster so there's still a lot of correlation to uh, you know self-driving like in the end it's an automated system one is a couple order of magnitudes more complicated than the other um but uh kind of as uber uh was going through the the recession they're doing a lot of reduction in force and reorging and as you can imagine uber Everybody got um, fired. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'll say, um, you know, like I, I have eyes and, and a LinkedIn account and so. Yeah, and so and then well, and ATG ended up getting sucked into Aurora, which is a whole another interesting. I remember um, that now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a whole another interesting thing. I'm very curious about, and everything I I'll say is like hypothetical, you know, speculation because I wasn't part of it when it happened. Yeah. But um, at that least, way. yeah. I mean it to me it's just like mind-boggling because aurora is actually my understanding was aurora is a smaller company than atg and i just don't know how you acquire a company with more people than yourself and like integrate that like i'm That's just curious what challenges they had to overcome do you have like a rough um, idea of like what the numbers were of like number of employees or um i want to say it was i'm sure there are articles with it but i want to say it was something like um, send all hate mail to like, podcast at ska.solutions yeah. <laughs> i think yeah. I think it was something from like a rough ratio of like one to 1 1.2. So it wasn't like okay. crazy amounts, but it's definitely like more people you were bringing in than were already there. Um, so I don't it's like, know an, it's like an aqua hire. Yeah, yeah, right. I don't know yeah. how many people got converted versus like some, not everyone got offers I heard. So like, yeah. um, and I think some of the article I saw quoted like 70% of people got offers. Um, so like maybe in the end, like after they decide who they're going to keep it, it was a little it's, more I wonder even. Who they can and why? Like that's that's an interesting because I feel like Uber already got rid of a lot of really good people um, because they had to because they were running out of money. So I don't know. Maybe maybe they were just yeah. people they didn't need because it was redundant positions. I, and I think part of it was logistics because I and like honest honestly I'm speculating, but like you yeah. know tax Same. regulations because they didn't keep anyone from Uber's Canada offices. I heard. Okay, that makes and sense. And so. Like, I think there a lot of it was like, oh, we don't want to deal with Canadian employee and tax codes or something. I don't know. Yeah. Right. That is far outside of my scope of knowledge. Um, but I mean, yeah, international so, business is really complicated. Like, I don't know. So that, that's kind of, I saw articles kind of, uh, they didn't specify that, but they said that they had none of the, the uh, Canadian folks stayed with uh, Aurora. But yeah, I think from Aurora, I'm curious, that was an interesting move because. I feel like, I don't know for sure that like ATG was the biggest self-driving employer yeah. in like the Pittsburgh area. Yeah, for and sure. And so when you acquire the, when you acquire them, like it used to be Aurora had to pay to poach people. Like, right, I definitely got pinged by Aurora several times when I was at ATG, right? Nice. Um, and it's like, okay, it's like, if you want me to move, you got to pay me more than I'm making now, right? Yeah, of but course. Now, like people don't have an alternative, right? You just took away their alternative. So I'm just curious how that affected like it's almost like a little offers. bit scorched earth. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's like cool. You can either work for Aurora or like. So the money they spent there, on the acquisition, they made back. <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't know. That, yeah. That's you know. There's a. I was talking here. to somebody from ATG last night, or not last night. Sorry, this would have been over the weekend, um, I need to sleep more, but, uh, basically, uh, I was at an event and, uh, they were telling me, um, nobody can match the pay there with ATG basically. 
Yeah, yeah. And, no, and I, it's I Pittsburgh. Feel like... you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, I'm really curious how the that dynamic would uh, is gonna play out. But yeah, um, yeah, that, that's kind of the sentiment I experienced when I was <laughs> yeah. I was there. I was like, yeah, I don't think anyone's gonna match this. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question, the the transition I think has overall been been well. I really like my management chain at at Root, and I nice. feel like they're super supportive, and they have they have good resources. We're a growing company. That's awesome. Um, you got so, options. Um, yes. Sweet. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, so, uh, we actually IPO'd. I don't know if you know that. So we oh, I'm sorry. In, I, uh, I wasn't fine. Yeah. Yeah. We IPO'd in the fall. It was a very interesting IPO day during COVID. I, I've been so. really, really addicted to buying and selling stocks lately. So had you told me, I probably would have bought a bunch of shares in route. Yeah. Well, I can, I can't, uh, disclose anything. Uh, so that would I mean, be... if the IPO has been publicly announced, you could tell me the day. Yeah, so I, I can tell you about the IPO, but I can't discuss, disclose Obvious, anything ob obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you on that. Public information. Um, but yeah, yeah. so. But if you were like, hey, we're IPOing, that's it. <laughs> it's been announced already. Yeah. yeah. That, that would uh, But yeah. But yeah, so. Cool. There's a restaurant I used to go to all the time and um, like to the point where I was like their third biggest customer. And um, I, I went there because I like the food, but also just like there was some interesting conversations. It was a sushi place and mm -hmm. they get into it and, you know, there were other regulars. I mean, it was just a fun dynamic. And so, um, and a lot of heavy drinking, which I mean, anyone that's watched this knows I'm a fan of. And so basically, um, I remember the executive chef one time uh, spotted me at, at like a street fair. Say, hey, how's it going? And we just started talking and this beautiful dog. And um, I'm like, hey, by the way, I'm Spencer. And he goes, what are you, high? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I see you every day. Times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I felt so bad. I was just ashamed of myself. Because like, I didn't recognize my uniform. Back, you're like, throw a big tip down and be like, sorry. I always tip that guy really well. <laughs> and his, his tip take for me is probably like over $1,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll have to, next time I'm in Pittsburgh, I'll have to take your recommendation. I like sushi. so Unfortunately, they closed. Um, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of the profit went up the no owner's nose. And... Uh, there were other things that happened so it was a good place though uh, I, I do miss it um i'm told the next plus place in town is i think umi i want to say mommy or Umami. whatever yeah you're right it's yeah i've been there they're pretty good they're pretty good i've been there i was there once or twice that was uh oh, no, no, not umami. there's another place called umi i think that like a pub oh. that's that's owned by the big burrito group so umami okay. umami is newer they're good i like them too um it might be uni like a like a sea urchin it's either uni or umi i can't remember there's umeboshi which is like the pickled plum which i really it, like it's the one that's on top of soba and ellsworth uh at college in ellsworth and it's it's kind of old school like it's where like uh cmu took like the yamaha engineers when we were doing the self-driving atv project and like okay it's, no, uh, yeah, i don't think i was there because the one i'm thinking about is in like the strip district lawrenceville border area is that like a second no, I don't. I don't know. So I didn't. I only got to live in Pittsburgh for three months before COVID happened, man. I didn't do very much. I didn't realize you were here for that that short amount of time. Sure. Yeah, that's what, that's what me and my fiance were talking about. I was like, oh, yeah, it's like yeah, we get, like move there and we unpack, and then COVID happened. And that was, <laughs> that was that's uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I loved it for the. Yeah, like, no, it was, know, it was fun like, hanging out with it. you. I'm kind of sad we didn't get to be friends for longer. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah yeah, yeah. so but yeah no i i thought that was a super cool restaurant because like it's oh like, we should put you, that graphic of you by the way on the uh the obama sign for the, the albums <laughs> oh getting me in trouble spencer uh yeah, we don't sounds, have like, to use that. <laughs> sounds like you said uh people weren't happy with my uh candidacy uh in uh, some of the neighborhoods there. So for, the, for those that don't know, um, during the last presidential election, um, I had yard signs made with Ken's face on them that said, yes, we mm -hmm. can. <laughs> in mm -hmm. the, 
By the way, the slogan apparently was was an inside joke from your high school, right? So that that wasn't something I came up with. I can't take credit. For yeah, yeah. So people, but we put it people, up in in a very democratic neighborhood, um, and people kept taking the sign down, and you know, like you know, eventually it became clear it was going to get thrown out, and so I'm just like, all right, well, then probably shouldn't have this around that neighborhood. So the person that had that in that neighborhood gave that to another person that lived in a very Republican neighborhood, and it started getting garbage thrown at it. <laughs> so, uh, I think I think what the moral of the story is is if somebody doesn't recognize the name, they assume it's an opponent, and they get mad at it. <laughs> so, that's your that's your lesson learned, Ozzy. I thought it was that I should never run for politics, but no, um, it's. I mean, you didn't do anything wrong. It's just I think I think people are like that's not my candidate. F that person. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh. you should never run for politics because politics is horrible, but not because uh, you're any less qualified for it than the next person. Uh, so I, got, I got a nice soapbox on it. I think we can't villainize politicians, otherwise we're only going to get villains, man. Interesting. Tell me more about that. I mean, that's is, is that pretty much yeah. it? I mean, the, yeah, I think... Uh, I don't know. I think like we as a society compound the problem because we want to like we want to get angry at our politicians and villainize them. And then that's like, OK, so like, I don't know, kids growing up or whatever, and they hear everyone rag on politicians and how like shady and crooked they are. They're like, well, I don't want to be a shady, crooked guy. And I don't want people to think of me as a shady and crooked guy. Right. Yeah. So you, like you essentially discourage honest people from going into the profession if you vilify the profession. And that's where we need good, honest people, right? And so, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, but I feel like every time we get somebody that seems honest, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to, you know, get too personally political mm -hmm. here. You know, it, it like that person gets ridiculed. You know, like. Um, but yeah, so no, I, th I think that's like yeah, one one day I think it might be interesting to to run for politics when I have enough money that I don't need to worry about making a list. <laughs> I mean, it costs so much coin to even run, right? Because you've just got to run ads. Yeah. And... Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but yeah. What's, what would um, be your motivation for doing that? My motivation? Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't know, I just like, I, I want to like help society grow productively, right? Like, I think. I, one of my things that I'm not a, a strict constitutionalist because this is my analogy. Like I, I want to like reform our government. So it re represents people better, but like, um, I, I feel like there's a, you know, some people, not all are like strict constitutionalists. It's like, Oh, our constitution is the greatest. It's been around 200 years. Yeah. But then if you went to someone and said, Hey, I'm going to give you the, uh, I, uh, the iPhone running, uh, the operating system from 200 years ago, <laughs> people would look at you like you're nuts. Right. Yeah. So sure. like, like the, Hey, you, you've got an ailment. Don't worry. I get the best medicine from 1776. Like, right. <laughs> I like, it was a good document. Um, but like it needs some, you know, software well, and, updates. And the whole point of its design was, you know, like, like a lot, I feel like a lot of bits were there being like, look, like this isn't going to be perfect. And, you know, yeah. like it, it was, you know, it, it came out of another broken system, which was, you know, being a British colony. You know? uh -huh. so, yeah, I'm with you. So, yeah. So I think that's kind of one of the, the things that like, yeah, I think it's just like our, our society has changed so much and the technology has changed so much that you can, you know, create new, interesting novel ways to govern and to like get people's I guess opinions and voices out than what we do today, and so I don't know. That's a it's a different you know theoretical, you know political science adventure maybe someday. Uh, well, I mean, I, I did notice that on the talking points we sort of went through before this, you had some sort of what could be construed as political ideas on there. <laughs> did you want to talk about? Um, I mean, the pay balance piece was interesting. We started getting into. Uh, I'd be interested uh, unless there's something else that. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I think it's interesting that you think that's uh, political. I actually don't think that's very political, but Inter so what, uh, okay. So let's first talk about like what would be your campaign platform? I mean, if you want to talk about that, so like <laughs> I don't know yet. Um, my campaign platform, honest, yeah, would be no, it would be something like this is what I'd have to like spend some time researching. Is like what would make sense as a way to like structure a government like right and so like some hypotheses that 
would need more like fleshing out would be like, instead of right now, like our political system is very geographically based, which when it was created made a ton of sense because like you didn't have the internet, you didn't have telephones, like, right. You could only communicate by like walking to someone or, you know, pony express if you, you know, this is oh, important God, enough. Around. Yeah. 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 So like, right. You know, it made sense for representation to be geographical because that was the only practical way to do it. <clears throat> but like nowadays, I think like representation should lean more ideological, like, right. Like you should say this person represents my views the most regardless of where I live in the country. Like, right, if 100,000 people have the same views, it shouldn't matter that they're scattered across all 50 states. We should know that 100,000 people have that view instead of like, there's one person in every state and their voice gets lost because in their geography, there's not enough of a concentration, right? You so I think there would be- interesting parties or, or groups or factions or whatever you wanna call it. I'm not super well studied on politics, obviously, but emerge, mm -hmm. I think, if you did that. I mean, yeah, you're right. It'd be- there'd be some differences mm -hmm. i think yeah and so i think that to me would be one of them is how do you get something where you can represent people you know not tied to geography right so you get truly you know at least I mean, there'll still be minority but at least that minority will be able to work as a group and have their voice heard instead of get drowned out kind of quite so easily so i think what level like, that's of just... oh i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off there yeah um yeah, so, um, yeah, I think that's kind of it. I think then, so, uh, go ahead, Dan. So to go into it, what level of politics would you actually have to be at to influence something that global? Because I feel like that's at the, like, kind of the root of the system, which strikes so, me as more difficult to, to change. So I think you'd have to work your way up, like, right, like anything. Like, so you'd have to try and find a place that you thought would be receptive to, like, taking a new form of government you'd have to start with the city in which case like geography doesn't matter that much because it's still a city but you'd have to like convince a city full of people that like hey maybe instead of you know we have districts one through 11 or whatever let's say everyone you know just says i like this candidate the best and then to be a represent representative you need at least a number of candidates but it doesn't matter where they're from in the city um kind of more like a purely at large um, election, right? And then you just kind of, you need to show that it works for a city. And then you move from the city to a county, a county to a state. It's, it's like, right, it's it's not a, you're going to see it in a few years. It's like, it'll be decades before you can kind of prove to a broader global audience that it's a viable option. But I don't know, there's, there's probably, there's yeah. probably ways. No, it makes uh, sense. So... But I think to me, like the interesting concept behind this um, and have no political science background. So I'm sure people that know more will know more than me, but like, it'd be that interesting. That was actually done in 1937 in Japan. It was a horrible <laughs> failure and here's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, but like if your representation like correlates to uh, um, voting power, like, right, you're essentially delegating your votes to someone else. So it's like, right, if someone, so like there's as many reps as there are people with delegates. So if everyone wanted to represent themselves in theory, then it'd just be a, um, was a direct democracy, right? Yeah, which um, I, I but, like the idea of that as opposed to representative democracy. But. Yeah, th there's a lot of logistical uh, concerns when it comes to direct democracy because trying to get uh, 300 million people in a room to vote on, well, we're gonna put a stop well, yeah, but I mean, Texas. We've got the internet. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I guess a stop sign in Texas is kind of low level, but. Look, right, and I think that's the thing is like, how do you balance the, the level of decision? And that's kind of where logistically a direct democracy gets hard. I'm but that's probably getting like... this wrong. But when I visited Switzerland, uh, maybe five years ago, I remember there were certain issues they were voting on. So one of them mm -hmm. was called like Echo Pop. And the idea was like, do we allow more immigrants in the country was the way it was explained to me by one of my friends from mm -hmm. there. And, um, everybody got to vote on it directly and so there were yeah. people handing out like echo pop nine stickers like don't vote yes on echo pop um i didn't see any echo pop yeah stickers uh but i was also in zurich which is very urban and so cities like immigrants because there's more of them there yeah um, and rural people don't like immigrants because they don't know any of them <laughs> so, <laughs> that's again it's a little more political than i normally get on here but i think we're fine and so um 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I thought that seemed like a good way to run things. Like, I, I just remember mm -hmm. really, really liking that and, and just being like, yeah, just let the people figure it out, you know. But, I mean, mm -hmm. apparently there's three of those a year that are posed to the, to the population. So that, yeah. that seemed like a good number. I don't know. I'm not saying Switzerland's yeah. perfect. I just, I just like that aspect of it. Well, and I think that's the balance is like, you got to decide, like I, if we spent all day voting, that's all we do and we wouldn't get anything else done. So you got to balance like yeah, what is true. the <laughs> right level of delegation. And that's kind of where it's like, well, it's like, Hey, I know Joe or whatever, whoever this guy is. Um, like he can, he can have my vote, Joe Schmo. Like, right. Yeah. I trust him. Like he's gonna, he knows what I want, but nine times out of 10, he can just vote on my behalf. And so then right. like, people congregate votes based on like, okay, oh, like I relate to that person, that person represents me more directly. And then if they do something that you start disagreeing with, or you don't think they're a good representation of your values, you can easily just switch to another person and like your one vote. So like, it seems like you're dropping the bucket. So it doesn't really matter. But when that happens in mass, like if that person starts doing enough things to anger people, right. Then they start to lose power. Right. And they're because of the, all the people that, had, they had proxy votes for and I'll start leaving, right? Interesting I think, way to look at it. That's that's actually a pretty compelling uh, conceptualization there. Yeah, right. And then I think coming, it, it forces a very disillusioned person. <laughs> yeah, like right. And I think it forces yeah. people to stay engaged with their constituents. Um, because if you aren't, then they can just take their vote else <laughs> elsewhere, yeah. quite literally, right? And give it to someone else that they think represents them better. Um yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, but I, I'm sorry to say, I think that leads to, you know, just devil's advocate, like, maybe like a little bit too much rhetoric or like, oversimplification of ideas. But I guess that would happen anyway, if you had a direct democracy, mm -hmm. because you would have to sell the campaign to the people rather than selling the representative to the people. So it would be just a different kind of... And, and I think what's uh, interesting is such a good direct democracy is how do you decide what to vote on? Like, right. That's true. So yeah. who, who wrote the proposal? They're like, they could just give you like a, a false choice, like one that's obviously good and one that's terrible. Yep. And so like, Kissinger instead of giving that. you the appropriate middle ground, right. Yeah. They're just like, uh, well, obviously you're only going to pick A because I didn't include B and so, C is terrible, right? Yeah. We can either invade this country next door or we can kill your whole family. What do you want to pick? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, interesting um i don't know I, I found a lot of it like being in a lot of different corporate companies how um you know com compensation works is interesting i did want to get company. into this yeah sorry I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so apolitical and bored but i feel kind of bad um but, but yeah so i don't know that's what you were kind of leading to so yeah, yeah. um i don't know i think it, i think it's interesting i don't know that's kind of my interest is just like human systems right sure. and that's probably why being a product manager works for trying to understand people and get them what they need, right? So yeah. I'm just always interested in like people and systems. And so and I didn't people. mean to dismiss politics either. Actually, now that you mention it that way, it makes sense why you'd be driven in that direction. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, so so pay scale, differences in pay, um, pay bands, which I hadn't actually heard called by that term until we just talked about it, even though I probably should have. Yeah. So yeah, uh, let's mm -hmm. get into that. So yeah, yeah, so I thought for our viewers, do you want to do you want to kind of define the concept first, and then we'll we'll talk about different ways it's done. Yeah, so um, yeah, so pay pay bands are a lot of big companies have them, um, and essentially they they help HR. I think like understand how much to comp people and et cetera, and also attempt to provide transparency to employees. And I say the attempt with an asterisk, <laughs> um, where it's kind of like. You know, they publish like, hey, you're a level ABC or whatever. And people who are of the ABC rank can make between, you know, $8,000 and B-thousand dollars and get C-thousand dollar bonus or something like that or whatever. <laughs> like, they essentially kind of say like, hey, this is kind of where you sit. When you get promoted, you know, to, and, you know, EGF, then you get a different band of monies you can make. A different set of uh compensation so for like an engineer l1 and an engineer l2 like what's the difference in pay because i think concrete numbers may help conceptualize this i honestly yeah. <laughs> i have no clue so that's uh um yeah that varies a lot by company but that's yeah. i don't know we go look up levels.fyi is that what it is they like list all the pay bands of different companies oh that's pretty cool 
Um, yeah, it's like a crowd sort of thing. Oh, well, they also have level, but let's see. So if I go, I'm just like pulling up a Google. So sure. Google L3, right? It says salary is 130. And so like For an L3, their internal. That's insane. That's yeah, funny. they're, and yeah, so their pay band is probably like 90 to 150, I'd guess. I don't know, plus minus 20, maybe 110 to 150. So just how good um, you are of a negotiator determines where you end up on that? Um, it depends on the company. It might be, uh, you know, they probably take some formula with their years of experience, et cetera, um, to like help do that. And then after they give you the initial offer, it's probably like some slot there for negotiation. Um, but what I've, what I've found interesting in the past though, is that those are like the published pay bands. And I've been at companies where I've ended up in like secret pay bands where it's like, <laughs> Oh, you mean, uh, the thing you publish publicly is not my actual pay range. Wait, I so FYI, but you said it was crowdsourced, so Google didn't publish So that, that. that is, like, right, so that's crowdsourced. So what's like, to stop in, somebody in a secret pay band from just publishing their, <clears throat> their pay anonymously? They, they could, right? So I think that's how it ultimately could get out that, you know, the pay band is incorrect or the published, the internally published pay band is incorrect, right? Um, but especially if company publishes it internally, why would you go and check an external source, right? Yeah. So I think that's kind of where the most accurate information is. is yeah, get it from the source, or so you think. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. And so that's where it's like, yeah, HR systems that have um, pay bands um, are like, oh, okay, so I can think I can make between, I don't know, uh, you know, one ten and and one thirty. But there might be another pay band where, like, actually, that's between like 120 and 140. And so you don't know that. And, like, if you're in the, at least in my case, being in the secret pay band, I didn't know how much, what it actually was. I had no clue what the upper and lower bounds were. Right. So, because the secret um, pay band, they just didn't tell you. Whereas, it correct. Right. Secret, yeah. So, I had it. And it's ironic because I only found out because I was trying to, to change roles. They're like, oh, you know, if you leave this role, you won't be in the secret pay band anymore. I'm like, oh yeah, the secret pay band. I knew I was in the secret pay band. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, it's very important. I would like to stay in the secret pay band. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> um, like, and that's how like, that's how hidden it is though, is that like, you don't know. You didn't even know until you tried to switch roles that you were in. That's interesting. Yeah, and they told me the other role wasn't eligible. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and so it's like, yeah, it's so like, I was looking at that chart thinking that was what my salary range is. And I realized like, whoa, my salary range doesn't even apply to this chart. Like, I just <laughs> ignore this chart. And, um, yeah, so I think that that was interesting. I think to me is kind of, if you were uh, outside of the range though, wouldn't that, that have been a giveaway or you were somewhere in the range, but you had the potential to go outside of it. So, so I was somewhere in the range and had the potential to go outside, which that I didn't know realize right so that's why i didn't you know notice it until uh i was asking about moving but i think what's like a little i don't know questionable is that like hey they tell you the um the upper and lower bounds when they when they brought up that point to you no no so i still don't know what the upper and lower bounds <laughs> I was just kind of found out that it like, just oh, seemed okay. kind of like like, like i'm getting a special, special thing. thing i don't want to mess it up yeah yeah, yeah right so um yeah, so I thought that was interesting. And I think though, but then it's like, I feel like you're almost like, you're telling your employees one thing and then like, so it's like you're setting their expectations. So if they're like, oh, I'm near the end of the pay band, right? So I can't make any more money. When in reality, oh, you could make more money if you went to a same level role that was secret pay band eligible, right? And then you could be making more money. Um, so I just, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's a very odd concept um what i the, the i think is like a pay band in general is odd to me like i don't know i've always looked at yeah, individually so, negotiated salaries but i mean that's that might also be odd i don't know i mean i think it's kind of the if you're if you're a large company and you have hr like hr needs some way to like bucket and triage things right and i think also communicate career progress and career ladders and so that's kind of where it comes from right yeah. it's trying to make that whole process easier um but then i've just kind of seen with time how like it starts to get manipulated because i think you run into things like well let's say you know role a um you know relative to role b has become more valuable they used to be like the same pay band yeah but now you know there's more demand for people with that skill set uh, yeah right 
Well, what do you do with all the people who are already in the lower pay band? Are you going to bump them all a pay band to meet the new incoming employees that need I to be? I it. Yeah, right? And so this is where you kind of get into some weird stuff where it's like, you know, if you didn't have pay bands, you could do the right thing easily. And I think just bump everyone's pay, right? But if you have these pay bands, now it's like, well, you have to go and give all these people promotions so they can now get paid the right amount of money. But they're not really getting promotions because they're still the same job title. But we realize you need to be paying them more to make sure they don't leave, right? Yeah. And so I think you get into this like weird, weird state that I'm sure HR professionals have, have some strategies to handle at least. Um, but I think it just makes for a weird thing. I think like to me, the the other extreme, so that's kind of more on the opaque side, is that like yeah. you go to something which is like, you know, radical transparency, which uh, I think would be definitely very hard on managers, but would probably benefit employees. We're just like, all employees know all other employees pay, right? Oh, Jesus. Uh, that sounds like, terrifying I don't even know how comfortable, <laughs> Yeah, I don't even know how comfortable a lot of employees would be with it. But I think, like, you yeah. get some benefit, you know. Oh, yeah, as I've, an em- I've asked people their pay before and just been like, I don't like to talk about that because, you know, I don't want to make people jealous, you know. And mm-hmm. Then I've had other yeah. people say, yeah, sure, it's X, Y, and Z, you know, this is. This is mm-hmm. exactly it. So yeah, so and I think like it's it's interesting because like if you do do that, then if you're compensating correctly, then all your employees need to look to for a good role model is whoever you're paying the most. Like, hey, you pay Sam the most, that's who I'm gonna try and emulate and learn from because that's what you value the most, right? Interesting. And so I think you send very strong signals to your employees. And if you can't justify why that employee is making more then I think that like brings healthy conversations, although difficult conversations up in the organization of like, well, Sam maybe was just a better negotiator. And that's why we paid them more. It's like, well, Sam's not more skilled than me. Like, right. Then like, right. And I think it would force. So what does that do for Sam? Do you just have to fire them? No. Well, in theory, right. (laughs) You know, ideal world, you'd raise everyone's pay up to Sam's. Or like yeah, but in, in the real right. world, you would probably have to bump Sam's pay because it's far less expensive to fire Sam or bump Sam's pay than to raise. And I, yeah, I think I think that's yeah, that's where you get the difficult conversation. You'd be like, you know what, Sam, uh, we really like you, but we can't comp you as much because it's not fair to everyone else. Yeah, right. We just cannot um, afford to keep paying your salary, and the optics are poor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think you're right. It does, and that's where it's like difficult if you try to flip the switch, like, right. And you're going to air all this dirty laundry at once because then people will be like, Oh, Mr. Manager, why have you been letting this go on for 10 years? Or I think if you do it from the onset of a company, well, you see Sam and I are lovers and <laughs> that's all there is to it. <laughs> Oh, but yeah, so yeah, I think if you do joking about that made up guy. <laughs> oh. yeah. But yeah, so I think that's kind of, yeah, I don't know. I think that'd be interesting. That'd be an interesting experiment. Not sure I'd want to be part of it. I would love to read a story about how someone did it. Maybe some small startup company. H- has it been done before that you know of? Or have you looked Not that it? I know of. I feel like, oh, I can't remember the name of the company where like the CEO took a huge pay cut to make sure everyone had a certain minimum salary. I feel like they I might've been pretty close. Too. I can't remember what that was. Yeah. Either. Um, I mean, the other thing too, is like CEOs, like, um, like high level C-suite people in publicly traded companies. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not unlike the investor statement. I'm pretty sure like those guys salaries at least. Yeah. So the, the, the top of the top. Yeah, they are. Right. You can go, those are end up being public record for publicly traded companies, but like I'm I'm several steps away from being the CEO, you know. So oh, I sure. think yeah, I need yeah. to like I need and I don't know, that's kind but of you're still like, a manager, I mean, which is why it's interesting, but you're also an employee. So I mean there's there's different interests mm-hmm. that you represent in that mm-hmm. discussion. So I don't know. I'm yeah. Just... Yeah. So I think um uh, but yeah, so I, I think that'd be like really interesting to be like, oh, uh, like, yeah, I think it'd be really tough as a people manager to, to have those discussions, but I think would be, you know, I don't know. It, it makes, it makes you like justify things. And if you can justify them, then hopefully it gets your people growing in the right direction. Um, right. And not just 
whining, but you know, they grow in the right direction, then that's good for the company, right? Like if th that's how they become more valuable is being more like the higher paid guy or person, yeah. um, right. Then I, I use guy to mean everybody, you know, <laughs> like at least in that context. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think then like you can give your employees good direction. It's like, Oh, that person's like, whatever. 1.5 times labels me right so i need to being more like that means i can make more i think you're right when you have the the situation where it's like oh that guy's not is not as valuable but they're being paid as more then that's like where you have corrections that need to happen um yeah we were talking about i think uh some of the stuff at uber that that made it sort of novel and unique um especially as compared against ford so we got past the seniority stuff uh, and you started to bring up a really interesting point before you got garbled. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, I was talking about like the, the, the essentially like, I don't know if iteration time is maybe the, the best thing. It's like also different domains. Like Ford, you're building a physical car that you need to produce millions and millions of, right? Um, where a ATG was more software oriented and then uh, not root. It's even more customer software oriented. Interesting. Um, is that, is the speed at which you can kind of iterate in those different problem spaces and kind of see your work, uh, you know, in other people's hands or, you know, the user experiencing it like Ford, you know, you're, I was on the research side, which is even longer time horizon, but even if you're on the product development side, you're still talking a couple, couple years before the designs you're making on a car, uh, get into, you know, real customers hands. That makes a lot um, of sense. And so I'm sure it's just extensive testing among other things that, that... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's just, yeah, like you got to get the assembly line in order and all that other, you know, stuff. It's like you have to reconfigure the plant. You have to test running the cars through the plant to make sure they're getting built right. Um, and all those kind of parts of the problem. And then I was in the research Whereas side. Whereas there was zero production on, oh, sorry, at Ford, you were on the research side. Yeah, Ford was on the research side, right? Cool. So like on my, on my side, that's like, you're researching something that may or may not be useful 15 years out. And it's kind of more on the, the pure research investigation side. Um, and so it was really cool though. And like uh, my group was trying to bridge that gap and bring it closer to like taking, trying to apply research and production sooner, uh, especially because we're on the manufacturing side, which is really cool. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. And then uh, ATG was, um, uh, you know, more software based that we're still doing hardware revs as well but um, those time scales were obviously much much shorter to get new hardware revs out test new sensors yeah you probably had like 200 units as opposed to millions yeah it, yeah so um yeah definitely order of magnitude several orders of magnitude less than units um and so was, you know do like new sensor designs new software designs like new software you could roll out obviously at a much quicker cadence than new hardware um but that was, you know, rigorously tested. So even that cycle kind of took a bit of time to where, um, you know, root words, you know, more customer facing and still rigorously tested, but we're working on smaller pieces and the, you, your risk factor isn't as high, like, right. So does that mean you've got like a central database and you just fork software off that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're all using version control, right. And uh, continuous integration to, to cool. kind of test that. And then, uh, so when CI I, took me a while to understand. Do you mind explaining that a little bit just for the viewers? Yeah, so um, I'm definitely not an expert in it, but I'll give a, a quick uh, high level overview um, where like CI is, um, at least in the software sense, is to, you're usually creating like a test suite that you can regression test against. So it's like, these are all the- and you say regression we, test. Yeah, so regression test essentially means the yeah, too many, Jargon words, thanks. It's all, it's all, I'm a hardware guy mainly, and I, I do know some of these words from software projects, but I, yeah. I'm an idiot in this world, so I appreciate you taking the time. Um, yeah, so regression test is essentially like um, you, you make a piece of functionality, right? It works, you wrote a test for it, that test passes. And so you start running those as regression tests. Every time you make a new piece of software, uh, you still run that test. And if you didn't do anything, wrong it should always pass right and if you did it's, do something wrong you've regressed correct so, and thus yeah. it's a regression test right Got it. um you've, you've gone backwards and says hey you know this piece of functionality used to work and now it doesn't someone should look at this um and so continuous integration is kind of applying those regression tests 
um, in your kind of deployment pipeline, whether it's you run them locally and if you get really sophisticated, you can run them before you like your code merges on the server, like right, it runs on the server and it's like, yep, this is good to merge. Now the test failed. If they do so fail- Jedi level get hub in. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, right. And so you can run those on, on the test side. Um, and so that's kind of the workflow uh, that they're using is that like, hey, we have these like test suites, it runs through. Um, we just keep you know running these tests as we develop more code and add more tests and more code um, to kind of, that's why it's continuous because you're continuously testing. I that's think. awesome. I don't know. No, that, that makes sense to me and I appreciate you taking the time. So that's one of the ways you're mitigating risk then at, uh, at root. Um, you weren't doing that at ATG? Oh yeah, we were, we were doing it at both. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, ATG also had like uh, essentially physical equivalents of this, right? So it was hardware. And so they had, the, yeah. um, you know. How do you regression test. test hardware? Yeah, so the, I, the, they had a whole team dedicated to that. Mm. Um, and they essentially had, you know, humans drive certain operations, right? And they were trying to, you know, instead of, you know, piece of software, you know, poking this button, you know, repeatedly, yeah. they'd have people drive things repeatedly just run a procedure see what happens and you yeah know, and, and so if just... it passes these different criteria then you're you're good mm -hmm. that makes sense cool so yeah uh yeah and so that was there's yeah. there... oh Good. sorry and i didn't mean to cut you off there I, I was gonna say one of the things that i found really interesting when moving so i i sort of did it the opposite way so i moved from um some smaller companies to like a bigger company, um, you know, before I was at SKA. So I, I was at um, Deep Local, SpaceX, and then Joy Mining. And so Joy Mining was like a kind of conservative, old school, multinational conglomerate. Whereas, I mean, SpaceX, you know, kind of a larger, they considered themselves a startup, but a lot of people would, you know, say, I mean, this would have been in 2013. So it was a while ago. So I was arguing, but there were, there were thousands of people there. And then Deep Local was like a little ad agency in Pittsburgh with like 25 people, you know, so a um, lot of differences there. Uh, definitely very different cultures, I think, was the biggest thing for me. Um, obviously, different methodologies as well. But I guess I guess the most noticeable bit for me was the cultures. So like Deep Local and, and SpaceX were both very much like meritocracies where I think Joy was like a little bit more concerned with image and, you know, mm -hmm sort of like a corporate conservatism, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I, I mean, I think those worlds perceive each other to be the enemy, but they, I mean, they're just kind of different. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, that was there a cultural difference, I guess, in those organizations that, that was noticeable to you? Mm, I mean, there definitely was. I'm trying to think the best way to articulate it. Sure. Um, yeah, um, I think... Uh, yeah, like to me, one of the things that stood out is this uh, notion of patience, I guess. Like that's the best way I I would put it. And I think it also maybe comes with, you know, time in the industry as well. Because I feel like I've also started to lean more that way in my career. But like um, at Ford, uh, like I was very young in my career and I kind of wanted everything to go quickly. And like some of the advice or, uh, you know, other employees that have been there longer is it's like, you know, like, don't sweat it. It'll like take a little bit of time and it'll get done eventually. And at least as someone very um, early in their career, I'm like, why, why wait? Let's just like, go, 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 go. Like, that's, right? that's common across a lot of fields, by the way. Like I've heard surgeons tell me that the young guys in the residency like try to be really fancy and do all this stuff and they end up having more complications than the older guys that'll just you know do like 80 percent of it and then the body heals up around it mm -hmm. so yeah that's interesting um yeah and so uh and so I, and i think you know part of that probably just comes with like demographics of the company where it's like i you know i feel like the newer younger companies have been at it's very much a different uh perspective where it's like okay like you do go faster you do you know um we're like right the the you're more focused on getting stuff done than you know kind of just patiently waiting and so uh, at least i like that now um but i think that's kind of a a personal preference on so that, that doesn't really speak to company culture as much as as your development as a professional i mean so i'm not trying to like trip you up right i just um 
I feel, I mean, I feel like it is company culture because it's like the, the culture of the people that make up that company. Like, right. I, you'll see that leaning. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. I, I might've misunderstood. So you're saying that at Ford, there was more of a, of an eye toward, you know, like don't sweat it, you know, give it some time. And at, at root and, and Uber, because they're kind of newer, you know, more startup mm -hmm. kind of scrappy companies, there's this idea of just like, go for it right now. Don't wait. It's got to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's also, there's, um, there's more of a sense there's like so much on the plate that you don't have time to wait, right? Like yeah. you're, you're resource constrained with mountains of work. So it's just like, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, we all saw that with Uber. I mean, for like public information, I mean, that, that I, I didn't work there and I mean, it was, it was obvious that, you know, resources ran out. And so, yeah, no, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's interesting. And uh, we do a lot of work with startups too, um, you know, I mean, and uh, we always find they're sort of our most demanding clients in terms of timeline, you know, which is, which is interesting <laughs> to say the least. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, you know, yeah, I mean, we call it startup land, right? And so it's, you know, we need it yesterday. The sky is falling right, right now. Can't wait. <laughs> and yeah. You know, and I think that's the, the also the interesting thing of prioritizing things at small companies is everyone thinks the sky is falling, and then you got to ask the question: is like, is it really falling, or does it, are you just panicking? And I feel like uh, as a product manager, that's like one of the most important questions to ask because every everyone thinks the sky is falling. It's like, okay, how how often is this happening? How serious is it every time we mess it up? Um, and then being like, okay, it happens once a year, and it's a very minor issue. Like, right? It may at least to that person, it seems large and you have to kind of contextualize all the, the people and what they're bringing to you and say, okay, like, okay, what's their, what's their consequence and what's the frequency. Right. And like, I feel like those are, this is interesting, cliches, but right. No, 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 no. This, this is fascinating. I mean, and, and this is like a really good conversation. So how do you, are you able to communicate that to the person that's coming to you with that, I guess that request or that timeline, or do you have to just kind of, put up with it and, and move on. It, it definitely depends on the stakeholder. Sometimes it's easier than others. And I think, uh, especially if you're in that hectic of a company, like the people are just like, I did my due diligence in telling you, I like, I think there's trust and you know, you know what you're doing. It's like, I told you, I got other stuff to do. I just wanted to make sure that like someone knew like, right. And you know yeah. now. And so it's up to you to like, make sure it doesn't forget, get forgotten about when we do have time to do it. Um, <laughs> but like to you to prioritize, this is a little, little fire and it, it's not growing. Okay. It's a contained fire. <laughs> there's, there's another fire over there. Maybe that, uh, it's going to grow uncontained if we don't do something about it. That makes and, a lot um, of sense. You got a triage. Yeah. And I think, uh, it's also a balance of like, there's, there's fires and there's also like just building something new. It's like, um, do you let, like a little fire burn that's contained so you can develop further because like as soon as you stamp out one fire then there's, you're gonna find small fires like nothing sure burned, like right so yeah. at some point you're just like and three more over there <laughs> yeah like you just oh okay well now there's a little bit there's a smaller fire right there and so you can endlessly you know bug squash pretty much like right there's yeah. an infinite number of of imperfections you can infinitely refine um when do you kind of call it good enough yeah. yeah um well, that's been a really hard lesson in my career, I feel like, because I mean, I, I think a lot of us, you know, kind of grew up perfectionists, you know, and, and, you know, we're trying to break curves in school and, you know, really kind of prove ourselves, at least me, like, you know, early on in my career and, you know, it's got to be perfect, every single detail. But then in trying to focus on all these details, you kind of lose sight of the larger picture. And there's, like you said, this rapidly expanding on contained fire over here that you're not putting out because you're trying to make all these little fires <laughs> you know like not exist anymore so yeah there's there's some wisdom in that for sure so i gotta i gotta ask you is uh how's how's your podcast going am i number 20 i think you're telling yeah, me yeah this will be episode 20 so uh congratulations on getting a uh, a nice balloons. round number <laughs> uh no balloons on this one uh however um I, I can have you mailed some if it's that important to you. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm giving you a hard time. Yeah, I know. I'm just uh, messing with you right back. Uh, how's the blog going? Like, uh, any, any, uh, I know you're on episode two, but, or rather, 
Article two. Article two. Yeah, I think I gotta take some lessons from you. I think consistency is the big thing. It's like finding the the time to to write consistently. Yeah. Um, I think that's how you build your audience and then just juggling other priorities in life, which it seems like you've got down pretty, pretty solid is Thank you. getting these out on a, a good cadence. Yeah. I mean, every Sunday at 9.30 AM, at least right now, we've iterated that a few times and because we've got such a long lag that might change by the time this airs. So sorry if I got it wrong, but um, 9.30 AM Eastern, 6.30 AM Pacific, I should say. Um, Mm-hmm. which is 8 30 a.m central <laughs> trying it every time so 7 30 a.m mountain time <laughs> you forgot europe you don't have any european viewers come on i hate europe i hope they all die in a fire <laughs> no, i love europe it's a great place um but no no, no. so i mean yeah consistency has been big um i mean re- really before i went into this what i did is i just asked a whole bunch of people who have done it, you know, how they do it. Um, I listened to a bunch of popular podcasts. So Lex Friedman and Joe Rogan were, were um, kind of muses, probably Joe Rogan more so than anything else. Um, Cause I don't know, the fact that it's kind of conversational and low key and comedic was a big inspiration to me. So I try to keep it light. I mean, you know, we, we came in with kind of some talking points, which thank you for writing those up, by the way, that was good of you. And then we just kind of went all over the place and kept it tangential, which was fun. Um, I don't know, the technical things kind of put us through a loop. But other than that, I mean, this is a fun conversation. Uh, One of the things I've really enjoyed about doing this is just getting a chance to, I mean, hang out with people. I don't get to see that often that I respect Mm. and learn things about them. I mean, when you're interviewing somebody and I mean, I don't know, um, like just from this conversation, I mean, we've talked about stuff that you and I have never talked about before and, you know, the time we've Mm -hmm. known each other. And so... I, don't know, I feel like it's it's kind of when you're when you're busy and you're trying to build a name professionally, you know, and you need like a work excuse to do something. I mean, it's it's kind of a nice way to kill two birds with one stone because, um, you know, sorry, bird enthusiasts, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I'd say, uh, you know, I mean, you get you get to make like a little piece of content that that you know is out there, but also you get to you get to connect with another human, and that's kind of the beauty yeah. in this format. Oh, that's it. I really like that. I didn't think about it that way, but no, that is pretty, that is pretty cool. You get to, yeah. Yeah. You get to connect with someone while producing something. Um, yeah. Well, especially during the Rona, I mean, it was a great way to just get the socialization in. and, and now that it's opening up and, you know, we're all vaccinated, presumably, you know, I mean, I, I've just been having people in studio and it's, you know, mm-hmm. it's really nice. I mean, I, I just had uh, Jorgen Pedersen from RE squared in. Um, got some really great guests coming up. Um, I mean, yeah, we've had like, you know, you're the 20th, so really, really good conversations, people doing incredible stuff and people I like generally. I mean, a lot of times too, I've never talked about this on the air, but I mean, you know, we'll we'll do these, you know, anywhere from like one to three hour conversations and sometimes even longer. Um, and then I I had a four hour one with Kenny Chen, who, uh, is, is like an AI policy influencer. Uh, he's getting a degree at Harvard to go, go back into that, but um, I mean, we talked about like, um, you know, China and Taiwan and, and all this crazy the social credit system for like four hours. <laughs> we're up very, very late making that episode. And it was just a good time. I mean, I haven't caught up with a guy in a long time. And then I, I had another guy on, um, Stephen Antelich. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced your last name, Stephen. I, I apologize. But I mean, him and I went for a drink after and, and hung out, you know, and I mean, you know, the, the cool thing about this, the studio is, I mean, you know, there's a lot of drinking on the show, obviously, I mean, you know, not tonight, but that's very much the exception rather than the rule. Um, you know, I, don't know, I can't do it all the time, but like, basically what it is, is, is there's hiking trails around here. So you can, you can hike, you know, and, and get it off before, before driving home. Or, you know, worst case, you take an Uber, but there's great parking. So, you know, it's, it's all, I mean, it's, it's just a, it's, it's we're really well set up for it. Um, I enjoy recording these. I like making them. Um, sorry, I kind of went off on a bender there. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's just cool, the diversity of people, you know. I was just like, whoa, I didn't know Spencer knew all these cool people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at some of your other podcasts, I'm like, oh, it's so cool. Yeah, that, that was kind of the idea, right? So it was like, you know, how do, you know, how do I kind of, Flex a little bit, but low key in a <laughs> in a way that's fun and, and also engaging, and, and people hopefully will find interesting and learn something. So that that's kind of been the idea 
I don't know if you saw the event that SK is sponsored with the PRN, by the way. I moderated it. It was like a webinar. So um, it was called Best Laid Plans, and and it was similar. So I, I got uh, Jurgen Pedersen from Murray Squared. I got um, Jeremy Searock from Advanced Construction Robotics. They make robots that do um, like the tie, tie right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Tie, yeah. tie the bot, what they call it. Yeah, the tie bot. And then um, Vibob Vora from uh, Gecko Robotics, who's their SVP of product, I believe. Yeah. That, well, that's, that's how I found out you had a podcast. I was like, whoa, man, you got a podcast? I didn't you know found that. out through that? Yeah, yeah. That's why I texted Fuck you. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> wait, you have a podcast? <laughs> that's they, awesome. they, like low key dropped it when you, they were introducing you. And I was like, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, Jen's great. <laughs> yeah, Joel Reed was on an episode that we haven't aired yet, but it's good. It's going to be coming out. Well, it will be out by the time this one airs. So I don't know why I'm hiding it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, uh, no, it actually, no, it has aired. I'm an, I'm an idiot. Sorry, it's all been a whirlwind and I'm still running projects. Oh, I'm doing <laughs> I, just, I love how it's like to your end viewer, they're not going to know the difference whether it's aired or not aired. Yeah. <laughs> you have like a time dilation issues now. It's like, I don't know. What's, what's, it, it, what it is, Ken, it's just so, I mean, when I get busy, I, as you know, I get really busy. Yeah. And so. <laughs> I, I'm putting these in the hopper so I can have a few months of, you know, if I if I need to put my head down and, and you know, be a roboticist, which which will happen uh, and does, you know, I, 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 you know, content will still be getting released on a weekly basis and that consistency mm -hmm. won't go away. And so that's that's the idea behind that. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's smart. That's what I need to get to. I just need to have like several things written and then I just like have a little script that really... <laughs> Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, and so one program I can recommend is Buffer, uh, which is pretty sweet. Um, and so you, you can put in like a Twitter, which I don't use Twitter. I hate that thing. But <laughs> uh, sorry, Twitter. I, I don't. I still hate you. Um, Instagram um, and like Facebook, LinkedIn. So basically LinkedIn, since we're a business to business company, um, we, we, we promote these on LinkedIn mainly, um, sometimes Instagram, sometimes Facebook. But, um, you know, they, you can schedule all your promotions to go out, right? So you pre-post to YouTube, YouTube can schedule, Anchor.fm is another good platform that we use, uh, and then Apple Podcasts. And then basically a Apple just pulls from the RSS feed from Anchor, so there's more automation there. And then, you know, you just batch them. So, you know, we put up like five or six episodes at a time, and then they're all scheduled to go out. So the viewer doesn't know any of this until, until now. <laughs> you <laughs> revealed your secrets yeah whatever i mean you know i want i want to see more of these so if you want to make your own podcast i hope this is helpful to you, you know? and uh yeah um i guess what's been your what was your motivation to, to start the blog uh when did you get into it how's, how's that been going um i think i don't know i think like everyone else during COVID, i was looking for like more hobbies right so i think that was kind of like part of it so i was like oh what can i do with my time and i thought it'd be like a good way to work on my my writing skills and i kind of wanted to work on developing a platform for like things i see um that i want to like call attention to and mine are more like like you, like, you know, we've kind of discussed, it's like, I'm interested in like people processes, like, right. And so it's like, how are people affected by data that they're exposed to and why might they be exposed to one workflow versus another? Um, and so just kind of trying to almost reverse engineer, uh, I'd say the product decisions of other companies. Like why did one, oh, of, the ones gonna, one of the ones I was going to do, maybe I'll have written by the time this goes out. Um, is like one on like uh, Amazon and why they, they've actually changed this back now. Um, like why they um, changed it from, they'd give you the shipping estimated date in your email to now you need to log in to do it. Like, right, you have to click through log in. And it's like, I'm sure it's because they over optimized for something. I'm like, but well, we know if more people visit our site, we get more sales. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, you're in there. So you're like, gonna right? buy something like they while were you're optimizing, there. You know, some product you know, metric that was like conversion or something or like getting more people to their website, which is great. So now you've forced me to click to get to your website. See so you, that, that number goes up, but now like my satisfaction as a customer goes down because I have one more click I need to get to, to get the information I actually cared about. That's interesting. And so that's kind of like those, but I did buy a stand mixer things. while I was saying that. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. So that's what they're going for, right? They want you to yeah. come back to Amazon now. Like, oh, there's this other related item I might be interested in, right? I don't know. Yeah. That's my, 
best hypothesis at least right <laughs> it's a kind of that's kind of what i was wanted to use it for it's like just a platform to try and like that just sounds like fun i mean that, i'm really interested in stuff like that and um yeah i mean this is obviously one of the things we connected over in the first place but um yeah, yeah. So, any anything else that like what have you written about already i kind of i kind of like so the, the, the main thing i think i to tell you about like i thought it was interesting about like wedding industry pricing like where did that data come from and then i kind yeah. of realized it was all coming from one source um i've also doing some how-tos i think i need to like find a, a good balance like um he's like i, I i've got fifteen thousand like... hits by the way on my how to build the world's most simple robot <laughs> that's <quite laughs> It's the dumbest thing ever, and it's got fifteen thousand. <laughs> well, this is what you'd be surprised on. It's like I'm, I'm shocked. Like the things that get hits and don't get hits. Although I've only like written two things. Yeah. Meanwhile, they're... I've written like really complex, well-researched articles that don't do near. <laughs> <Well, Yeah. laughs> like subject matter experts. It's like so in the weeds that nobody is interested, and it's boring. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So I think. Um... Yeah, so, uh, and I, like, I don't know, I'm trying to find the balance of, like, I want to, I don't want to sound too negative, like, you're right, complaining about every company, so, like, I have to have some, like, how-to on how to, like, counteract these situations you're in, right? So, it's, like... Yeah, that makes um, a lot of sense. I feel like, like that, that's an easy trap to fall into, is the cynicism, and... Yeah, right, and so yeah. that's kind of what I'm trying to find the right way to, to balance. Like, here's an article about, like, how, like, I don't know if deceived is the right word, but, like, right, you're, like, data is being used to manipulate your behavior and this is how you can counteract people trying to do that right yeah at the same time um and so that's kind of uh the the strategy i'm going for and we'll see how that develops that's cool i mean i was on the goog the other day and i just noticed like in the settings there was i think it was the goog it might have been some other um thing that it, that's used commonly but there's some setting that was like serve me customized ads and it was just checked <laughs> <laughs> what good is that doing me <laughs> yeah. and I like, you know your ads are going to be more boring now right i'm like that's the idea <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know in theory in theory if the ads are good there's something you actually needed or wanted and was well worth the money and i don't know some idealized for uh, sure i mean and, and that, market that, eco economic view of the world and I mean, I'm, I'm a fervent capitalist, right? I mean, I don't fully hate on that, but at the same time, it's like, I spend way too much money and you know, I can, if I didn't know a thing existed, I mean, you know, I mean, chances are, unless, you know, I mean, if I'm looking for it, you know, I'll find it. I don't know. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't think talking about things that uh, are good. People don't realize, like I got my dad a, a Fitbit, right? Like he, like he would have never bought a Fitbit, right? I don't know. That was essentially like I bought it for him. So I guess he didn't pay for it, but yeah, for it's Father's like something Day? he got. Yeah, for Father's <laughs> nice. Day, like right. Uh, like it's something I got him that I think brought more value than it was. Like if he would have known it would have brought that much value to him, he probably would have bought it. But he didn't know that. But I thought it would. So Touche. Okay, that's that's a really good counterpoint. Like right, and so in, in an ideal world, if like targeted marketing is doing it right, you'd be like that. It's like, hey, here's this thing you didn't know about that will bring you more value than charging you for it yeah um but i don't i don't think uh what is it uh oh i've i've only like quarter read this book but like economics of misbehaving i think is like a really good book that talks about like um like the theoretical uh econ is what he he like dubs it um it's just this like thing that makes only rational economic decisions. It's like that person doesn't exist. Yeah, that's horseshit. Like, well, that's one of the first things they teach you in, in business school, which, by the way, also horseshit. <laughs> but, um, I, I say that kind of tongue in cheek. I mean, you know, there's actually econ was one of my favorite classes when I was when I was in business school. Uh, but that that's one of the first like day three. They're like, yeah, the rational consumer is a is a myth, you know, and so. Yeah, and so it's kind of like, well, and so I think, like, his book was a very interesting idea trying to, like, break apart the human behavior of, like, how people actually think when it comes to economic decisions instead of, like, purely rational economic decisions. That's interesting. What was the book called again? Uh, the Economics of Misbehaving. <laughs> economics of Misbehaving. That's, that's, that's I'll, I'll send you the title afterwards. I yeah. don't um well, I think there's there's another like one i really like uh influence the psychology of persuasion okay. it's uh it's this guy robert cialdini uh that was like an arizona state professor that was one of the first um i guess he was um 
I'm gonna get his title wrong. Uh, he was like a, I want to say like a social psychologist maybe, but he was applying like quantitative metrics to sociology. And I mean, you know, I know that's been made fun of a lot, but it's interesting because I, I used to not really take it seriously. And then I started reading these books and I don't know, it's really interesting stuff. And, and it's, I guess it's not all quantitative. Like there's, there's just some, so like one of the things they talk about is, um, when like the police are interviewing a suspect in a crime, mm. um, conventionally, um, they will videotape it from over the officer's shoulder. So, you see the face of, of the suspect, um, but not the face of the officer, which in the eyes of a jury, when that footage is played back, there's the subconscious association that if that person is looking right into the camera and there probably is a little bit of fear in their eye, and I'm trying to get some aspects of this wrong. It's been a while since I've read the book, but there probably is some fear in their eyes. And also they're on display and, and they're sitting in the chair, you know, you very much like in a position that a guilty person would be in, you know, you would think. Mm -hmm. So he, he sort of, you know, like you, he doesn't want to be so cynical. So one of the things he says is, you know, if you ever find yourself being interviewed for a crime, you didn't commit, you know, before you get interviewed request that the camera be moved to the side so that it shows the officer and the person, mm -hmm. you know, in you, and, you know, likely you'll get a more fair shake in court. Like, and, I don't know what the data is to support that. I, I think, you know, he cites it in the book, but it, it's just like little things like that. Another one that was interesting was, um, you know, uh, if there's a catastrophe, if, if somebody is experiencing a heart attack, for instance, and, and they're in a crowd of people, you know, and they do the thing, or I, I don't know what a heart attack looks like, because I haven't seen one up close yet. But, um, you know, if, if basically if someone has a cardiac arrest, and there's enough people, there's a confusion of responsibility and nobody does anything. And that person can mm -hmm. die from like lack the of bystander medical attention. Or whatever, yeah, right? I think that's what it's called. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, at the end, he gives the advice. If you ever find yourself in that situation, single somebody out and say, help you, please help me. You know, I'm, yeah. call, call 911 immediately. Like, you know, this is, this isn't, you know, something's wrong with me medically, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, th I, th I thought that was interesting. It was just a collection of different social observations. And then he did another one that singled more in on the business implications. Because I think that was a big market for the first book that he wasn't anticipating. And so mm -hmm. it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I don't know. It's, uh, anything else that you want to, uh, you want to talk about, you want to plug? Um, obviously, um, please subscribe if you made it this far to collaborate with Spencer Krause. Better than every other podcast out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Check out my blog. I'll, I'll shoot Spencer a link. A product for evil. Um, yeah. I don't know. I thought it was a catchy name. We'll, we'll yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. Well, cool. It was great. Great catching up. Thanks Spencer. for coming on. Good catching up with you too, Ken. Uh, let's do it again. Sometime. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.